Good evening. All right, let me let me let me try that again. Good evening. We'd like to take uh, a few minutes to welcome everybody tonight. We are uh, very appreciative of you being here. Um, this is going to be a special night. This is something that we have uh, uh, kind of been working on here uh, the last two weeks, and um, tonight um, our goal is to to share this full story of Christmas to you. Uh, not only with the scripture, but also in song and uh, in message. And um, as we go through this tonight, I just pray that you uh, would be open to, to hearing everything that's said and everything that's uh, done from our praise team. Um, I want to start off at the very beginning and say a big thank you to our praise team. They put in a lot of hard work the last two weeks. I also want to say a very special thank you to uh, Todd upstairs, who's been here most of the day helping me out. We got a couple other guys up there, Will, Matthew, Jesse. They're going to help us out tonight. Uh, Ben's helped us out, but he's a new daddy today, so uh, he couldn't be here tonight. So we're thankful. Yeah, we're thankful for that. Um, thankful for the opportunity uh, that, that Ben does to help us out. So um, we're going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get started tonight. And I uh, pray that the Lord would bless you tonight. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come in your house, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity we have to share the gospel. Lord, I thank you especially tonight that we have the opportunity to share the message of the true Christmas story, the story of all stories, God, when you came into our world and changed our lives. Lord, uh, an amazing story that we will look at tonight, and I pray that for those who are here who may have already known the story or those who may not know the story, Lord, I, play, I pray that we would paint a very clear picture tonight through the words spoken, through the music that's played, and through the thoughts that's shared, Lord, that you would be able to be seen through everything, and I pray that you would use this tonight for the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Alrighty then. Well, we'll just keep going. Tonight we want to, uh, to talk about this Christmas story, the greatest story that is, uh, has ever taken place. And before we get into the actual story, we have to kind of look at the story before the stories. Uh, specifically looking at the opportunity that was shared in the Old Testament. There were several prophecies that were shared in the early times that led us to, uh, to where we get to in the ultimate true part of the Christmas story that we all know. Uh, there were three particular scriptures that took place that we want to, uh, to look at tonight uh, to start off with. The question of who would be the Messiah, it was answered in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. It says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We also would find out in the prophecies from whom he would be born and what he would be called. In Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. And then finally, where he would be born. The significance of this coming out of the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler of Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So in the prophecy that was shared, the setup to this whole great story, the question that would be asked for the following years after these prophecies were shared was, who is this king of glory? Luke 1, 26 through 38. 
In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. In this scripture, we see a couple of things, and the first thing that jumps out is the story that starts off with the sixth month. And this is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, the sixth month, meaning uh, the sixth month in a lady by the name of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Elizabeth was married to a prophet named Zechariah, and previous to this encounter between Mary and the angel, Zechariah and Elizabeth had a revelation happen in their, eye, in their life. They were both very older in age, and they were unable to have children. And while Zechariah was serving his duty in the temple one day, an angel came to him and gave him a revelation that he was not going to have a child. And he even give, went so far to tell him the name of the child would be John. And we, of course, know that that would be John the Baptist. And, of course, this revelation would change Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. So there was a great deal of comfort that the angel was trying to show to Mary during this revelation. We also think about the town of Nazareth. Nazareth was a small town, but it was not isolated since it was near a lot of important trade routes along the way. And we think about the name of Jesus, which means the Lord saves. Mary was confused of how this could be for her since she was a virgin and never had been with a man. She probably felt as though she wasn't as favored as the angel had proclaimed. Matter of fact, she was even told about Elizabeth, a member of her family. She was proof to Mary that alone that nothing is impossible without God. They lived in great distance from each other, so this news was a surprise, but it also was a stimulant to Mary's faith. So Mary submitted to God's will. This is significant because if you look at what she would face in this event, you have Mary who was a young unmarried girl who became pregnant and she, this basically in this time had disaster written all over it because of a couple of things. First of all, unless the father of the child would marry her, she would probably remain unmarried the rest of her life. If her father rejected her, she would be forced into begging or even prostitution to earn a living. And if her story about being made pregnant by the Holy Spirit was revealed to others, imagine the people that would have thought she was just pure crazy. So she accepted the unknown for the will of God. What obedience and faith and some of which we lack even today when we ourselves try to do our best to live for God. Luke 1 39 through 56. At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy stands to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thon thrones, but has lifted up the humble. 
He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Since Mary had not told anyone of her secret, the first person that she would tell would be Elizabeth. Mary, Mary traveled many miles to have this time. And ironically, when Elizabeth would come out, it would be Mary that would show up. No explanations were needed as Elizabeth's baby in her womb leaped for joy. Plus, if Mary had any doubts at this time at all that this was real, Elizabeth's reaction alone was enough to calm her doubts. Mary's song that is proclaimed in that scripture spoke of God being a champion to the poor, to the oppressed, and the despised. She expressed great humility instead of pride when she said, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. If she would have denied her position, she would have been throwing his blessing right back at him. Remember this, pride is refusing to accept God's gifts or taking credit for what God has done. Humility is accepting the gifts and using them to serve and praise God. Don't deny, belittle, or ignore your gifts. Thank God for your gifts every day and use them for his glory. Mary would stay on with Elizabeth until the baby was born when she returned home. The ride back home to Nazareth must have been with mixed emotions of great joy and expectation, but also curiosity and concern of the reactions made by the people and, of course, with Joseph. So now Mary would wait, thinking to herself, Come thou, long-expected Jesus. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in. Through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. We see the strength of the engagement period during this time. Back in this time, first century engagements were a lot more binding than the modern day engagements now. It was a formal agreement or a contract that was bound for both people to be married. This relationship could only be broken by divorce, which was a very public and a humiliating event. There were three steps to a Jewish marriage. The two families agreed on the union. A public announcement was made. At this point, the couple would then be pledged. It could only be broken by death or divorce, even though there would not be any relations during that time. The couple was also married and they would live together. Because of their engagement, the news of Mary being pregnant was a social standout problem due to the unfaithfulness that is by the Jewish customs and the laws of the past. By Jewish law, she was subject to have a public trial 
and even Jewish authorities could have stoned her to death and imagine that being put out into the street, stoned to death. Joseph was also faced with some difficult choices in this story. He could have divorced Mary privately or he could have had a public trial, then she would have been something that would have been subject to stoning. But there was this third option to marry her. He was making a decision that not only affected him but Mary and her well-being. And although he knew that taking her as his wife would be humiliating to him as well, he chose to obey God's commands, which showed his mercy, his discretion, his sensitivity, his responsiveness, and also a self-discipline to not act just on his feelings alone. And the angel's declaration was important because it revealed the truth to Joseph that the baby is both God and human. The infinite, unlimited God took on the limitations of flesh and humanity so he could live and die for all those who would believe in him. The name Jesus, which basically means the Lord saves, showed that he came to the earth to save all of us. Because we can't save ourselves from sin and its consequences. We can't eliminate the sinful nature, thus we needed a savior who could save us from the power and the penalty of sin. Emmanuel, God with us, with us as flesh and now in spirit. And Joseph changed his mindset after learning that Mary was not unfaithful. Although many would question and scoff his decision to wed Mary, he had to do what the Lord commanded. Not what people thought was right. Sometimes we refuse to do what is right because of what others think. We must obey God rather than to seek the approval of others. A virgin birth from a teenage girl, a carpenter, in a very tough situation. This was indeed a strange way to save the world.
2, 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and lied him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. A Roman census, a registration was taken to help aid military uh, tax collection and conscription back in the time. The Jews didn't have to serve in the Roman army, but they could not avoid paying taxes. So there was this decree that went out in God's perfect timing according to God's perfect plan to bring his son into the world. This census enrollment was called to take place in the ancestral cities of all citizens. It was about a 90 mile journey from the town of Nazareth to the town of Bethlehem. Because both Joseph and Mary were descendants of David, Jesus would be born into a royal bloodline as spoken in the Old Testament prophecy. The government forced Joseph to travel many miles to pay these taxes. At this point, Mary was expecting at any time. The problem came that, that when they were looking for shelter, there was no available room for them anywhere in the town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was probably crowded by those who were responding to this census. I'm sure this was a discomfort to not only Mary but Joseph, but it was proof that sometimes when we do God's will, it's not comfortable all the time. Sometimes we are promised that everything, even our discomfort, has meaning in God's plan. An inn of the New Testament times was a primitive structure with a central courtyard for animals surrounded by cubicles to accommodate travelers who came through. There was an innkeeper who was there who must have went all out to help with the privacy for this couple. The baby would be wrapped in bands of cloth to keep him warm and to give it a sense of security. The mention of the manger in this verse is the basis of traditional belief that Jesus was born in a stable. Stable were often considered caves with feeding troughs that were mangers carved into the rock. The surroundings were primarily dark and dirty. Not the best ideal situation for a newborn baby. But the Jews probably didn't expect this to be the birthplace for the so-called Messiah King. They probably thought he was going to be born into a royal atmosphere. And also remember, they also probably thought him to be a great military leader that would be coming. But you can't limit God by any expectations. And for Joseph and Mary, he was truly there with them. Tiny fingers 
2, 8 through 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Luke 2, 39. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. The shepherds were generally outside the circle of respectability. Basically, they were looked down upon by those with bigger statuses. Their occupation kept them from observing the requirements and rituals of a Jewish faith. This revelation to them was a great example of grace and exemplifies the ministry that would be with Jesus, as mentioned in Luke 4.18, to preach the gospel, to preach the good news to the poor. The good news was for everyone of all circles. He would come to any of those with a humble heart that accepted him. These shepherds may have been those who supported applied the lambs for the temple sacrifices that were performed for the forgiveness of sin. Here the angels invited the shepherds to greet the Lamb of God, the ultimate Lamb, who would take away the sins of the whole world forever. The glory was over the shepherds, which led them to be frightened at first, but then that turned into great joy as the Messiah's birth was revealed. It was noted in the whereabouts in Bethlehem, the town of David. It was a threefold claim. He was a Savior. He was the Messiah, which was Christ and the Lord creating the relationship to sinners, to the Jewish people, and to God himself. Yet he was not found in a temple or a palace, but in a cattle shed. Peace on earth was the peace that salvation would bring to a world of sin. We see that which is basis of many carols and many songs that were composed over the years. Imagine the power and the majesty presented by the host of angels who praise God, not like our praise but angelic praise. Instead of sitting there and scratching their heads, they not only received this news with great joy, but they had to go to the place of the birth to see for themselves. So they would go then and quickly, after seeing the baby in person, they would go and spread the Messiah's birth to everyone. The shepherds would discover this crude shelter that was there with a young mother and a carpenter. It didn't change their belief that this was what the angels had revealed to them. It was received with amazement and the shepherds returned praising God for all they seen and heard. And we think about Mary at this time, through all of this to the point where she would sit and take it all in. Her life, which was nothing more than common, changed so much and was forever linked to the newborn Christ. She must have gave considerable thought to all things and knew that indeed God had brought her to a new chapter in her life. It would be safe to say that even though we hear of no words from Joseph during this time, he too would be taking in all this with great joy. A lowly carpenter, but with great integrity that God had bestowed upon him with the responsibility of not only being with Mary, but being the earthly father to Jesus. There was an ample amount of time between verses 38 and 39, so we don't really know whether they returned immediately to Nazareth or Bethlehem, but as we will see later, they would indeed come full circle. And at this time, we would like to ask you guys to stand with us because as these shepherds heard the message and they went to see the baby, they went proclaiming in great joy, and that's what we're going to do as we sing a song, Go Tell It on the Mountain.
Matthew 2, 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jeru Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler, who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly, and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for this child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warmed in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The day of Herod consisted of a line of princes who ruled Palestine for about 150 years. King Herod was the appointed king during the Jesus birth. Some translations say that the wise men and other magi, which meant diviner, legend had played a big part in the concept. For example, in popular culture, we have the song, We Three Kings. And although the Bible does not say how many wise men there really were, it does not describe them as kings. They were more likely a type of priest or even astrologers who studied the heavens for light on coming events. It was natural that they would seek direction in Jerusalem since Herod's place was there, and he had gained fame from the reconstruction of the Jewish temple. But there was a new star in the sky that was understood by these men to signal the birth of a king. The motion of the star also led them to Jerusalem, knowing that there was a hope for a Messiah the star of hope. Herod was very insecure, believing others were wanting to take his throne. When asked by the Magi about someone born king of the Jews, Herod realized that he had not been born king. Rather, he had obtained this rank through political intrigue. He thought he would face stiff competition. Herod had made it a point of killing anyone who was a threat to the throne. So this news of a newborn king sent fear into the heart of the people. He assembled all his priests and all of his scholars who confirmed the prophecies of the Old Testament, which also named Bethlehem as the place of birth. Herod was able to find out from the Magi when they saw the star, allowing him to pinpoint the age range of the children in the area of Bethlehem to be found and murdered. He told them to report what they found so he could be a part of worshiping him. We see that the family had moved from the temporary shelter of the stable to a home of some kind. It was believed that Jesus was around two years old at this time, based on the decree forthcoming by Herod to kill children two years and under. The gifts presented were normal for the times, especially for royal recipients. Gold was presented for royalty. Frankincense was worship according to divinity, and the myrrh used in embalming was a provision against death. Each gift had its own significance for the life and a ministry of Jesus. And God had revealed to the Magi in a dream that Herod was scheming to murder Jesus. He told them to not let them know that they had found them. So when they left Bethlehem, they went on another route. This was the first part of God's plan to disrupt Herod's evil intentions. But we are looking at the thankfulness and the worship that was displayed by these Magi as they brought a Christmas offering to the king. No one. 
Matthew 2, 13 through 15. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew 2, 16 through 19. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Matthew 2, 19 through 23. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea, in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Luke 2, 39 through 40. They returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. We see the story of the family fleeing to Egypt. Joseph, who was a key human figure in God's deliverance of his son, Joseph left at once, showing that he was in full trust and submission of God's will. They had to get out of the region for their safety and survival. Egypt was yet another confirmation of a prophecy involving Jesus. As mentioned in Hosea 11.1, 1, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. A strong Jewish colony had existed in Egypt, and even though it was under Roman rule, it was outside of Herod's jurisdiction. Both Israel and Jesus went to Egypt in their infancy, and both were called out by the Lord as part of the world's redemption. And we see the very insecurity of Herod and the fact that he wanted no threat to his throne to the point where he led to the disgraceful slaughter of innocent children just so he could destroy the life of one victim. Jesus and his family were returned to Nazareth. The death of Herod was a sign that allowed the family to return from Egypt. And since the new king was a ruler in southern Palestine, Joseph went north to Galilee in case the new king carried out his father's evil traditions. Nazareth would be the final stop on this incredible journey for this carpenter and this young girl. They would come full circle. It led them back to where their journey began. Nazareth was a place of great independence, and many Jews despised them for it. They had contact with many people from throughout the world, so they were the recipient of a lot of news. And also it was thought that Matthew mentioning Jesus as the Nazarene was in reference to Isaiah 11.1. 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. Jesse was the father of David. He made it understood that Jesus came from a humble beginning, as mentioned in Micah 5.2. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old and from ancient times. And tonight as we go through and we have shared this story to you, and maybe parts of the story that you've never heard before, or maybe scriptures that you've read before, but you've never really paid attention to the details and the thick, rich text that is revealed in this awesome, amazing story. My prayer and our prayer tonight is that you have received this as you look at this story and that you think about everybody that is in this story, everybody that we all can relate to, from Mary to Joseph to the shepherds to the Magi to Zachariah to Elizabeth. Everyone in this story had a major and important part but it was Jesus, Jesus, God himself that would come in the form of a baby, come to save us, to redeem us, to forgive us. And if you don't leave here with anything else tonight, I hope you leave with the understanding and the promise and the security of which is Jesus, that he died on the cross for our sins, to forgive us, to give us new life, so that we may live with him in eternity, and that we may be able to praise him for eternity. So tonight, as we close out tonight, I want you to think about where you are in your life. 
And like I said, maybe this is just another story to you. Maybe it's just another part of the Bible. And maybe it's just something that we only pull out once a year. But I challenge you to think about it in depth tonight as we have laid it out for you through scripture, through thoughts, and through song. May you be thinking tonight, is Christ really enough for me? Is he really enough for who I am in my life? We are so dependent on so many people and so many things every day. But are we truly dependent? Are we truly trusting in the Almighty God? As we ask you to stand with us, we're going to sing two more songs. We thank you for coming tonight. And we ask you to worship with us tonight as we sing Christ is Enough. thank you so much for coming tonight I don't know if you figured it out early on but for me the last couple of days having a couple of te technical difficulties at the beginning is not a surprise because I, I really think that the enemy didn't really want this night to happen 
Uh, we've, we've, we've got sicknesses going on, not only people dealing with colds in the team, but also in our families. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff going on. We've had computer issues the last two days. I've had computer issues. Uh, the enemy just doesn't like it when we talk about this story because it scares him to death because it reminds him of his future. So I'm just thankful tonight that we have the opportunity to come in here and that we can sit here and not only share this story, but share it through the scripture that's been given to us and share it through song. So as we dismiss tonight, we're going to dismiss with one more song. It's a little bit upbeat. Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, youth, when we get done, I need you guys to stay put. I need to have, talk to you about a couple things. But for everyone else, we thank you so much for coming. So I ask you to join us. We're going to sing one more song. This song is called My Soul Magnifies the Lord. the peace.